And welcome to the QCast Season 3, Episode 4. And this, folks, is a big one that I'm very excited about. I'm calling it the Men's Basketball Top 25 Roundtable. And yes, it is just about that time of year. So we're just a few days away from practice starting across most of, of Division Three uh, men's basketball and women's basketball. And with that time of year, we like to start thinking a little bit about who the top teams are. And to do that, we usually talk d3hoops.com top 25 poll. So I've assembled an esteemed panel here today. I have, uh, including me, I've got four other uh, d3hoops.com top 25 men's basketball voters. And uh, before I introduce all of them, I just want a, a couple disclaimers here. This group or, or no one individually speaks for the poll. We are individual voters that have opinions. And so if you want to get mad at us, just, you know, tweet us and, and be mad at us. That's okay. But we don't, we don't speak for the website or the poll. We're just voters in the poll. Um, second disclaimer, it's really early. We, we don't have rosters for most teams. We don't have the voters packet, which is probably a week and a half, two weeks away. And so know that we're just going to do our best to generate a little interest, get a little buzz going, and most importantly, have fun. So let me introduce this world-class QCAST panel that we've assembled here today. First of all, I, I, I'm looking here, bottom right screen, uh, please help me welcome Akiva Poppers. Akiva, of course, coming to us from uh, Yeshiva, where he managed Max Live and did incredible things. It's good to have you, Akiva. Uh, my bottom left, my good friend, Ryan Whitnable. Uh, Ryan, of course, is the founder, the creator, the host of the Great Lakes Invitational Tournament, where it appears that most of the Final Four teams now flow through. So kudos to Ryan. Um, everyone knows Ryan Scott on the top right. Ryan of D3Hoops.com fame does a ton for the D3Hoops.com crew, including being a voter and a man that needs no introduction. If I could give an Ari Lamb type intro right now, I would. I don't have the words or the inflection. But folks, before anyone, before any Yahoo could make a random podcast, when, when you had to know what you were doing, there was a man out there. There was one man, and his name was <laughs> Dave McHugh. And he founded a little show called Hoopsville, folks. And he's been doing this a long time. And uh, before we finish here, we'll ask Dave what his plans are for this year and when things <laughs> might be going. But we're glad to have Dave here. Um, gentlemen, let me just start with Mr. McHugh. Uh, I know we haven't gotten the season cranked up yet, Dave, but how are you feeling coming into another season here? You know, I was worried about Scherzer's fastball. Uh, I wasn't really positive if Verlander could get through six. Oh, I'm sorry. We're talking hoops. I'm still in the middle of baseball in my head. I know you um, are. Sorry, I couldn't resist. <laughs> I'm actually, I, it's kind of interesting. I'm excited while at the same time scratching my head a lot heading into the season. I'm excited because I think, you know, I'm going to go way back into the well here. We used to get all excited about parody and we talked about how much it was parody in men's basketball and how deep things have gotten. And, and that was leading into the pandemic and then post pandemic, we're like, well, where's everything stand? I think we're back into this men's basketball in division three is deep. There's a ton of parody. Yeah, There's a lot of good teams out there. Not, and I think last year we were a little surprised and I don't mean this in a bad way that Randolph make it, it ended up being so darn dominant that it wasn't necessarily anybody can beat anybody type right. scenario. I, when I, you know, Randolph make it ended up proving to be one of the best teams I ever played in division three basketball and win a title. But I do feel like anybody can beat anybody this year. I, there isn't any head and shoulders. They will be the team this year. And that kind of is exciting because then we get to learn about maybe more teams than we normally do instead of getting hyper-focused on a chosen few. Absolutely. Uh, Ryan Whitnable, your, your thoughts. I know that you spend a lot of time thinking about the poll and the ballot. And I know the last couple of weeks you've been starting to chip away at it. Uh, before we get into individual teams, uh, Ryan W., but your thoughts coming into this season last year, Randolph Macon was number one, the whole season and, or at least most of the season and uh, <laughs> they finished number one. And uh, we come into this year 
it's a little different landscape. So Ryan W, your thoughts coming into this one. Yeah. Well, first, first, Bob, I want to, you know, it just seems like yesterday we were, we were sitting in Fort Wayne and all of us were uh, minus Akiva talking, you know, about the final four and, and we were wrapping up the national championship. Uh, I know it's always nice to get a little bit of break from D3 hoops for a while after the season, but uh, it's good to have everyone back together and, and talking hoops again. Um, yeah, to your point and, and to add what Dave's already said, uh, you know, I think last year we had a large theme around, you know, the post-COVID season. There was a lot of uh, teams that had a lot of experience, a lot of fifth year guys that were coming back, and there were a lot of very deep experienced teams. And, you know, as we've been sifting through the rosters and kind of looking at the landscape this year, a lot of those guys are gone this year, and and there's a lot of question marks out there. And I think there's going to be some questions as to, you know, what programs uh, will reload this year and, and which ones will kind of rise, you know, from the middle of conferences or bottom of conferences up. So uh, it's definitely a different landscape this year. And, and Ryan Scott, just to kind of picking up on that a little bit, a year ago, we were talking about all of these fifth year guys and all of the, the, the returners. It almost seems to me like the story this year are the guys that that are gone from 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 last year. Is that one of the things you're looking at, Ryan Scott, this year is just the changing faces, the changing teams? Or, or how are you looking at this year as it's about to get started? Um. I mean, uh, I think the the unknown that Dave mentioned, you know, one of the questions you asked us to be ready for was two teams you're confident with in the top five. And I, there's no way I've got two teams I can name, right? Maybe I could come up with one. Um, you know, we just don't know what's going to happen. I, there's going to be just as many, you know, fifth year guys over the next couple of years as that COVID year kind of works its way through the system. Maybe we won't know. They won't be as name guys the same way or, um, they, you know, we'll get used to it at some point, but, um, man, I just, am looking forward to a year of basketball, right? I mean, this should be fingers crossed the first time in three years, we don't lose a game to illness, right? Fingers there may crossed. still be a few players who lose a game to illness, but we shouldn't, there shouldn't be games that aren't played because of that reason. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I couldn't be more excited coming into the season to see what's going to happen more because. I couldn't predict it if I wanted to, right? I don't want to have a guess at all. Right. And, and Akiva, uh, on your end, last year was your first year, I believe, as a top 25 voter. I know you put a ton of work into this thing as evidenced by some of our back and forth around, what do you think about this team and that team? Uh, Akiva, your thoughts coming into the 22-23 season as a, as a top 25 partisan here? Well, last year we said, oh, this is going to be the hardest year ever for a voter because we have all these fifth-year guys. Right. Who knows who's the top team? Is it trying? Is it making, you know, is it Yeshiva? And then making just ran through everyone. Was, oh, okay. Maybe it was actually very easy. Right. Then you come into this year. Oh, we have no clue what's going to happen. You know, maybe it'll be the same thing. Maybe it'll be something different. There's, there's truly no way to know until, until the games are played. Um, for maybe the reason why there's a feeling of, Oh, I'm the, the field is wide open is because, it just happens to be that a lot of conferences appear to be somewhat wide open, but on a national stage, there's uh, probably just as much of a general picture as there would be any other year. Um, but I guess to Ryan's point, um, you know, in the top 25, you're forced to put together, oh, these are the top 25 teams. So the team you put at 21, you're saying this is a top 25 team, but that doesn't necessarily mean you think they're a top 25 team, right? Right. You're putting a team in number five. You don't necessarily think they're the number five team or they're the top five team or they're a top 10 team or they're a top 25 team. You just have to put a team in number five. You don't have a choice. That's the way the poll is. Um, so preseason, I mean, just want to try to get a feel for things. And then over the course of the year, once games kind of play out, um, obviously as you get deeper into the year, it'll, the picture will form just as I'm sure it does every year. Yeah. And, and kind of to, to your point, it, it feels at this point like we have no idea what, what's going to happen. At some point, there, there'll be certain things that start to synthesize and it becomes more clear. And I'm guessing it'll look more like it always does. You know, um, this program will be good and that program. So we'll we'll see. But boy, it's a fun time of year. And, and look, we'll, another disclaimer here to everyone is we know that a, a preseason poll is, is not worth a ton. It's fun, right? It's for fun. Um, there's been no games played yet. And so we're, we do our best. Uh, as voters in the preseason poll to line the teams up 
as best as we can and we all work hard at it, but we know that we don't take this too seriously. We, we know this doesn't mean anything at the end of the day, but it, but it is pretty fun. So let me ask you guys, I asked you to think about some really, really uh, general questions or maybe not general, but specific questions. And the first one, I wanted to go right to like the top of the ballot. And I didn't want to pin you down to like, do you have your top five? My, my way of asking the question in an easy fashion, and it's probably not. And I'm going to start with my friend Ryan Whitnable on this one. The, the question I had for everyone is, do you have two teams that you feel good about in the top five at this point? And, and Ryan, I, I'd like to just sort of ask you to, to name one of those. Like, do you have a team that you're like, oh, for sure, this team will be in my, my top five? So this is this has been top of mind for me for for a couple of weeks now, and I, I feel like uh, while not wanting to definitively put it into concrete yet, I, I feel like I, I I know where I'm going with my number one pick, and, and a team that I, I would feel most comfortable with in the top five is is probably Christopher Newport. Um, you know, they were one of the top teams last year. I think they finished third in the poll. Um, I think John comes back, and they've got that big six eight guy who's coming back for his junior year as well. Um, they were one of the most impressive teams that I saw last year, and they bring most of that core back. And, and I think they're going to be in the conversation at the top of, of the top 25 most of the year. It, it's it's a, certainly a great call and a team that's, that we think is going to have a, a big year this year. That They beat Randolph Macon. That was on their, their own floor, on CNU's floor. And now watching what Macon did, it sort of elevates that to the point the voters said, heck yeah, slid CNU into, was it third, you said? Came yeah. in third, right? Um, so that's an interesting call and a really strong one. They're, they're, they're way up there right now in my radar. Ryan Scott, um, now you, you, you declared that you don't know who, who the heck to say here in the top two, well, but is there a team or two that you're like, yeah, they're, they're up there? So I don't know that they will be number one, but I think the team that I am most confident will be good this year is probably Oshkosh. They're bringing almost everybody back. They've got a long track record now of being, you know, a top five team for, you know, what the last four or five years, um, really talented guys, good coach, great league. You know, I, I mean, maybe I won't have them number one, but I would be most confident in them being number five and still being there at the end of the year. They, they have a great nucleus. I think one of the, the more underrated uh, point guards last year, was their guy Plomin. I, I love him. I think he just controls the game and he's in a quiet way. He's so like physical with the ball in a crafty little way. And, and Levi Borchette, I, I mean, one of the elite players in division three this year, they lost a couple really key guys. I know they lost like Eddie Mensch, but Ryan, I am with you. I, I think that Oshkosh is way, way, way up on my preseason ballot. Um, DMAC, I know that you're, uh, you've been out there working things for MLB and you just got back from St. Louis and head spinning, but I think there's a real easy one that's still on the table for you. Uh, any thoughts on your, uh, the, the top five of your ballot currently? I don't, I don't know if, if the, one, the ones I have in my head are, are the easy ones you have on yours. I've got a couple of maybe dark horses even. Listen, first, I'll get like it out of the way. I'm going to still be considering Randolph Macon. I, I, I don't think you ding, can ding, ignore There it was. There you go. I don't think you can ignore the fact that what Josh Merkel has put in place there. And by the way, the foundation that has been laid over several coaching staffs over the, over the decades at, at Macon, I think is something they can continue to build from. And we have to remember one of the things that made them so good was the guys who came off the bench were so good. And yeah. Josh doesn't put guys in unless they can play really good defense. So I don't think you can ignore the yellow jackets and listen, if I had to put a pen to paper right now, they probably are still in my number one conversation. It albeit again, we don't have all the information on everybody who's back and, and all the other information, but Randolph Macon's in that conversation for me. I got a bit of a dark horse maybe, but I, I think you have to watch out a little bit for uh case Western reserve. Yeah, they have gotten some serious transfers and I'm not a huge guy about who's transferred and who's been recruited and stuff, but I have been kind of keeping tabs on that program and they've gotten, and they even have one guy coming back from last year that everybody was talking about. Sorry, names escaping me because I just don't have it in, in, in my head, but 
I think you got to watch out for them. I think they're going to be good, which kind of gets to your another question we have coming later. Um, listen, Mount Union maybe jumps pretty high because I know they have got a ton of talent coming into the season. And another team I honestly have, I know you asked for two, but these are the four that kind of jumped out at me. WPI. I know that this is a team that we always say, hey, they're really good. They're really good. And then when brass, it comes down to, to play and for the marbles, it kind of falls apart, but they played really well last year and their two top scorers are back. So well, they, I was just going to say, so they lost their two guards, but I was looking at the roster to prepare for this and pops up a six, seven, four year starter from Clarkson, who is a grad transfer right. this year over there, you know, like they're, yeah. they're going to be really good. And no, they I think, Macon I think, as well as anybody. Yeah. I think um, they're in the conversation. So I know you asked for two, but those are four that have kind of been floating in my head for the, no, for that's really good. And the, we're, we're going to get into the UAA, but just to tease it, Holy smokes. When, when you think about how deep that league is yeah. right now and, and uh, but just think about it. So, you know, Dave's throwing case out there as a potential top five team, you know, Oh, by the way, how about Rochester? We know about Emory. We know about Wash U. Uh, I know Ryan W has a little sleeper from that same league that he's going to want to talk about here in a little bit that I very much agree with. Mm -hmm. So um, the UAA let's get back to that in a second. Um, outstanding. And, and Akiva, how about you? Your kind of your top five, is there a team or two that really jumps out right now for you? All right, so, so you asked for two, so I put together three, and they just happened to be Macon, Newport, and uh, and Oshkosh, so there goes that. Um, but I guess just, just to add a few points on each of those and then um, also expand on a few of the other points um, that were made, and then I'll throw a sleeper in, too. Um, so with, with Newport, um, according to the roster, uh, Ronnie Graves transferred there from Middale, so that's a big score. Um, I, I'm a little bit concerned about the loss of Agner just because, I mean, from a three-point shooting standpoint and spacing the floor, obviously that's a big loss. Um, but I, they're going to be in my top three, I would say, probably no matter what. Um, and then on the Macon front, um, in terms of how high I am on talent, um, I've put out there publicly for a while that I thought Josh Talbert was as good as anyone on the team in terms of um, – his help defense abilities particularly. And the one game that they lost last year against Newport, he didn't play. So, I mean, it, they're obviously losing Buzz Anthony is big. Um, I think if they get a second three-point shooter or someone else steps up in addition to Will Coble, um, who can help them face the floor, I could definitely see them having a repeat. Um, and then on the Oshkosh side, they get back Will Mahoney, who didn't really play last year because yeah. the ACL. So if he's healthy, that's obviously a huge get. And I think the only big starter they lose is Mench. I don't think they lose anyone else. I think everyone else is back. Um, and that freshman for Oshkosh, the, the, the freshman last year, the 6'8 kid, every time I flesh, watched him, yeah. I thought, yeah, I kept saying he is going to be a freaking stud. And I bet you that this is the year that that starts to happen. Like, they, don't forget, they got a 6'9 guy that just gets to roll in there this year, probably as a starter, and it's going to be awfully good. So oh, yeah. I, I think Oshkosh is, is legit there. Anything else, Akiva, on that, just the, the starting point of the top five there? Yeah, I, th I would throw in Williams into the discussion. Um, they bring back eight of their top nine. Um, they lose um, a guy who was already there, I think, in definitely in 1920, maybe 1819, Jovan Jones, who was one of their top um, on-ball defenders. So that's a big loss, but they're not even close by far the, the biggest team in Division III. Um, and they have a really nice balance of upperclassmen um, like Proud Smith and Karen and the underclassmen um, who only played just last year and are getting now, they're going to have massive minutes this upcoming year. Um, so I think I'd throw them into the discussion too. Um, and then with WPI, um, I think it kind of slipped under the radar just because we were all looking at Adams and Lowther last year, but Aiden Callahan was really good too. Um, so, I mean, they will need uh, someone who can shoot because they mm -hmm. lost the two guys who can shoot on the team and you really can't win by just having six, eight pounded in the paint. And then you have six, five to complement it and a right. point guard, but uh, I'm sure someone will step up. So um, they belong in that conversation. I'm sure. Yeah, I, I, I don't, I, I think they're a tier below. I think there's a limitation on, as to how good WPI can be. Um, but certainly in the top 10 discussion, they belong. Very good. They return a ton. They're talented. I, I like your Williams call. I saw Williams last year 
at the sectional and, and boy, like every guy on the floor is like six, six. I mean, it is amazing how big they are. Um, and so I think that's a great call. They're all a year older. They're almost all back. Um, you know, there's one that, that I had that made it all the way back to me that, that I probably feel about as strongly about as any team coming in. Uh, I'm going to say Randolph Macon's in their own category, but uh, Mary Harden Baylor. I am a huge fan of, of Mary Harden Baylor coming in. Now, had they not, not made the run last year and gotten themselves to the elite eight and a basket or a, a couple seconds away from getting to the final four, this probably wouldn't be quite on the radar as much for me, but I went and saw them play at UT Dallas last year. And it wasn't until then that I realized how good Josiah Johnson was. When you watch him, um, things you can't see on video very well. So you got him and Prince, they have their top four scores back from an elite eight team. They have a couple new guys, one, one a transfer that they're hoping for pretty darn big things from. So I've got Mary Harden Baylor very much in my top five at this point. And I love most of almost everything that you guys threw out. Like I'm big on Oshkosh. The other thing I wanted to say, and, and maybe Ryan Scott, I'm going to ask you this, make a point and then ask you is I think Randolph Macon to me is um, I'm going to, I'm going to call it Worcester category. What I mean by that is for 15 years in this poll, I just put Worcester down on the ballot because they were such a reloader and they were just under Steve Moore. They were so good. They were so talented. If they lost four starters the next year, I knew they'd be fine. Um, I I'm looking at Josh Merkel right now as probably as long as he's there, I'm writing Randolph making down unless something crazy happens. I just feel he's got the program in a, in an unbelievable way. And if I'm going to gamble or guess at the top of my ballot, that's probably the direction I'm going to guess. Um, Ryan, just your thoughts on where he's got that program and where kind of where they go from here. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're all set up to keep rolling, right? Like, um, they, they get talent coming in. I mean, one of the things I talked to him a couple of times in the off season and, uh, you know, he's not big on the, the awards and the trophies and all that, but I mentioned, I was like, those sure help with recruiting though, don't they? And he gave me a smile, you know, like that's, they're in a tight, they're already coming off a great year and they're just going to get more players into a system like that. Right. That's well run. They've got plenty of funding. You know, there's a lot of support there. Um, a good alumni network. They're connected with all the, the high school and the AAU programs. I mean, they're just set up to just really, really be good. And, yeah. and the way he plays that defense, you know, as long as you get in and you learn what you need to do, um, there's a lot of guys who can get plugged in there who maybe are not, you know, super great individual talents, but will will play an outsized role in the system they've got. So, yeah. um, you know, like I always used to joke that Buzz Anthony was really, really good, but they've got a 30 point cushion from the national championship game, right? That um, they have <laughs> right. to play. And so that's true. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's they can drop off quite a bit and still be the best team in the country. So, yeah, I think uh, there's sometimes uh, there are programs, you know, Stevens Point was this way for a long time. We could we could list a bunch of them, just programs where you feel like coming into the year, hoping Calvin back several years ago, not quite currently, maybe they're getting there, hoping Calvin, um, you could just pencil them in at once upon a time. I think Randolph Macon is, is at that point. Um, let me go in reverse order and ask this question. I asked you about the very top of your poll. I'd like to know, are there teams that were either out of the top 25 at the end of last year, or they weren't on our radar at all last year in the top 25? that you're pretty certain this year that will be, that'll be in the middle of that picture. Akiva, um, anyone come to mind along, kind of a sleeper, someone out of the mix last year that, that, that will be in it this year? Well, I don't know if it's a sleeper, but I guess I'll take the easiest one here, which is Middlebury, um, being that they return everyone, um, inclu I mean, including Sam Stevens, Alex Lovell, probably, I mean, in terms of a one-two punch, that's about as good as you're going to get. Um, but I mean, that team is, is really big and really good and really young and came into their own kind of over the course of the year. Um, I think they had six losses, so they didn't have the toughest schedule for a NESCAC team, which can happen. Um, but I, they weren't on my real radar last year, but maybe like 40 or so last year. So if a team is, is kind of 
getting onto the radar, but I'm not really considering them to, to vote for them. And they return everyone, and they were a young team. It's not like everyone's back for their grad year, and they've already had four years together, and you already kind of know how good each player is. These guys were all playing for one or two years. Um, they are going to definitely be on my top 25 ballot. Yeah, that's a good one. To me, they're, they're a, a surefire top 25 for me uh, personally. And I, I want to get to the uh, the NESCAC in just a few minutes when we talk about, like, you know, I, is Williams a favor? Is Middlebury a favor? I want to talk about how close that margin is. Ryan Whitnable, how about you? There's uh, there's a lot of options here. And I know that uh, you've been stewing on this kind of stuff for a few weeks now. So what do you got for us? Who are the, who are the sleepers? Give us one or two of these things. So I'll, I'll stay in that same general Northeast region and a team that was kind of floating in that 30 to 40 part of the poll last year, but I think makes the jump this year is Keene State. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Keene State brings back most of that entire core off the team that got to the second round last year. Um, they quietly got better as the year went on, and, and they kind of peaked there and, and nearly getting to the Sweet 16. Um, I think they're a team that, that probably starts in my top 25 this year, and, and I expect them to be, you know, I, I will say one of the favorites in the Northeast uh, this year, but, but certainly in that top four or five teams that I'm, I'm thinking about in that region. They should be an outstanding team. And, uh, Hold that. If you got another one, I'm going to come back to you here. So uh, we'll we'll get get around the room first. Dmac, what are you thinking? Um, uh, you're good at this. You always like to throw these dubious and the dark or whatever these things are. You ask us about. I think I'm asking you about it now. So sure. Tell me what do you think, Dave? Is there a team that 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 you're saying this year they're going to come into the middle of this poll and and be the real deal? Who you got? Um, I actually struggled a little bit with this one because. I think it's, this is where I struggle with not knowing who's back and how many team or yeah, how this many, is a tough one. Yeah. And so usually when I start to find those, it's after we've gotten this wealth of information put in our laps and we get to pour over it. Um, so I did struggle with this. I, I think one team to just, I'll just throw a couple teams out there that I'm just going to have my eye on. I don't know how high they can get, but Chapman, I think you got to watch out for out West. Um, for all accounts, I think their best shooter is back. Um, I think they've got some pieces there that they can put together. I think the, and listen, we've talked about this a ton, but I think that conference is just way um, under the radar for people. That is a much better conference. Yeah, the sky has been really good. And, and last year, the the championship game, was that Pitzer versus Chapman? Do I have that right? Um, that final? It was Sunday? Pitzer. I thought, it, yeah, you might be right. I got to double check. But the, the league itself, to your point, uh, distance-wise, obviously, is the biggest challenge is it's so isolated. You know, they have a hard time scheduling, although they do a, they do a pretty good job of getting some people there and doing some traveling. They're doing better. But if They're you're, doing a if, lot better. If you're a team good enough to contend in that league, you're a team good enough to make a run. And I think yeah. that's your point. As you're looking at Chapman, like, hey, they've got pieces back. Right. They could do some damage. That's a good call. Yeah, chat, that that's the kind of team I kind of see. I'm curious how Guilford – turns around from last season and and to that point in the same conference how does roanoke come back now again clay dunley and i went to school together i always want to put that out there so people don't uh, you know understand the dynamic there a little bit i am kind of rooting on for clay i want to see him succeed but they showed some signs last year i know i was i was voting on them pretty heavy at one point but those two teams in the odac kind of filling a little bit of the void there at the top I'm, I'm i'm very curious about how those two i think they can jump into this conversation a little bit and listen you, you talk about Mary Hart and Baylor. That was a pretty good call. What about Trinity, Texas? Like, yeah. are they going to take the next step forward under, you know, kind of a new regime as it were? I think last year surprised me. Can they keep that going? So those were four teams that it just kind of, when I looked at it haphazardly, to be honest, I just went, you know what? They're kind of on that radar. They're on that radar. They're ones I need to keep an eye on, even if nobody else is, or if they're really deep on the, on the list. Uh, good, those are very good ones. And, and Ryan, Scott, how about you? Who's your kind of your sleeper coming into this season that might be very much in the middle of the top 25 this year? So one of the teams that I think is going to be really good, um, there's a lot of potential there, is Letourneau um, down in Texas. They're bringing back yeah. two guys who averaged 19 points a game. Uh, really strong team. They played Mary Harden Baylor tough every time. Um I think that's a good coaching staff down there. I think that's that's one to to really keep an eye on. Um, one farther down that I don't know, they won't be top 25 early, 
but may still be hanging around there. We know uh, Oswego and Brockport will both be great in the Suniac, but I think New Paltz is really set to do. Oh, this is the new well. Yeshiva. I can feel it. This is going to be the new team right here. New Paltz, I, I love it. I I have not watched them play more than very very minimally, but I know what they're bringing back. I know what they did last year. I'm not sure they'll be better than third in that conference, but that's a conference where the third place team is sort of right, can be right on the bubble of a top 25 right. spot. Because Brockport um, and Oswego, they seem loaded. They're going to be very good. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I think New Paltz finished fourth last year. They're bringing almost everybody back. Um, and then one more I'll just mention. I don't know what they're going to look like, but St. Thomas of Texas is eligible this year. Yeah. They were the cream of that That's conference last year they just destroyed everybody now obviously they still had some scholarship guys left that they won't have this year but seems like a really strong program lots of big guys you saw them at st louis right like yeah big tough team that i i think is part of the culture down there that that they could look pretty good yeah and i i, I think that from this conversation we're probably going to feel like the asc is a very strong conference be, because we've already named quite a few and and kind of my dark horse team is, is Harden Simmons. So when we think of, of Texas, there's a lot of folks that think that Texas is overlooked on the D3 hoop stage and the voting and everything. And now that I, you know, I'm here down here in Dallas, maybe I'm carrying that flag this year, but tell you what, there's some teams in Texas that we just rattled off that, that can play. And I think several of them are going to be in the poll at various times. Well, and it comes down to the same thing every year. How much does the ASC hurt itself? Right. You know, whether it's scheduling, whether it's beating each other up, a combination of both. We know there's good teams down there, but sometimes they peak early, they get beat up, they get hurt or whatever, and it doesn't manifest itself in the end. And so, yeah, I think we've all been bullish on a lot of ASC teams, especially in the, since Mary Harden Baylor made that a miraculous run in 2013. But I think what we also are realistic of is, can you put it together for the whole run or at least when it counts? Yeah. And I think that's where we always, we always end up buttoning up a little bit against the, the brick wall. I will say just a, a quick shout out. There's a lot of programs that have stepped up their scheduling this year. I think there's a lot of folks that said, you know what? Okay, we get it. You know, we can't have a, a low SOS or whatever, you know, no RROs. And a lot of programs have gone out and scheduled really well. So kudos to all of them. Um, no particular order on this. I'm going to kind of maybe start off with someone and then we're going to dig into it. Um, I want to talk about a few conferences. Ryan Whitnable, you follow the OAC very, very closely. You follow every league closely, but the OAC is kind of your bread and butter. Talk to me about like preseason. If you had to vote in a preseason poll right now in the OAC, like who who's one and who's two? I'm just curious. Come on, Ryan. Spot here. Yeah, you so, can't go on last year's numbers. <laughs> I, I think there's 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 three teams to consider in the OAC when you're talking about the top two spots, and and I think it's your your three usual suspects: Marietta, and Mount Union, and then I think this year you have to consider John Carroll to be part of that group uh, in terms of you know voting for for the top spot or top two. Um, Marietta and Mount Union have kind of become you know in the last four or five years kind of the top two programs I would say on a yearly basis in that program. Um, both coaches, Fuline and Vanderwall, recruit very, very well. It's, it's one of those programs that uh, have kind of snowballed themselves into being good year in and year out. I think the interesting thing this year is to, is how do you factor in what John Carroll has done in the offseason? Yeah. Um, you know, four or five Division One transfers, a great Division Two transfer, uh, big center, 6'8 kid from Hillsdale is coming into to John Carroll as well. And so when you look at John Carroll on paper, that is a very talented team that, that – you know, could make a very deep national run. Um, I think the, the the thing that I'll be interested to watch in the first couple of weeks of the season is, is how all those guys gel together on the floor mm -hmm. um, because chemistry is, is a big part in, in, in the success of a team. And and until, you know, we can get a look at, at John Carroll for the first couple of weeks, I, I think, you know, we'll wait and, and make that judge at that point. But certainly on paper, they have to be in that conversation. They, they may be the right. most talented team in the conference. It's a good question on John Carroll. And, you know, as, as those guys were committing uh, over the course of last spring and through the summer, I always look because there's a difference when you hear division one transfer, sometimes those guys were walk-ons at their division one. And to, to me, a walk-on is, is no different than 
than a, a division player at three player. In fact, most division three players that are on the floor playing are better than most walk-ons, even in the big 10. Now that said, I think these guys at John Carroll, I think these are scholarship division one guys. And that is, that is very rare. Like it actually seems like it happens all the time, but a guy leaving a scholarship in division one and coming division three, it, it's pretty darn rare. And, and they're loaded up on them. And Ryan Scott, I'm just wondering, would you factor, would you vote for John Carroll based on knowing they have a bunch of division one transfers, or would you wait to see how that all gels on the floor? How do you handle those deals? Well, I wouldn't put him top two in the conference right now. Just because one, John Carroll also plays a pretty tricky system um, where they're they're swapping guys in and out frequently, and that's going to take some time to get used to. Um, you know, Mount Union is bringing back a lot of guys and then adding Gurley back in, who was an all conference performer as a sophomore. You know, and that's a really strong. And Marietta's got the the tradition. Right. Um, maybe you know, once we get down to the you know eighteen through twenty five range. I might feel more comfortable putting a John Carroll in there untested, but I'm certainly not going to give in that particular context with that many guys. Cause you also don't know so you're bringing five guys in. You might have completely angered every guy who's already there. Who's losing minutes. Right. Who right? Knows? You have no idea how that's going to work. Um, right. I want to see those, those guys play before I, I really just shoot them up the board. I'm in the same place. I, I would vote for both Mount Union and Marietta ahead of John Carroll, but certainly when I get down into, you know, the 20 range of my ballot, I'm going to start saying, okay, time for a really good flyer. And that's probably one. Um, I want to move away from the, uh, the, the OAC for a second. I want to go to the hey, Bob, Can I just yeah, please. One, one quick thought on Carroll is we've been down this road though, too. They've gotten transfers. They've gotten some great talent and it's fizzled. It hasn't materialized. They were eight and 16 last year. I'll be honest. I'm not positive. I could put them in a top 25 until I've seen them. I play. think that's fair. Yeah. I, I not coming off eight and 16. Um, it, it, it would have to take some blue chippers for me to go, Whoa, okay. Maybe I mean, we've seen Carol get guys, the system, whatever it is, it doesn't work. And I'm not trying to knock Carol. Cause I, I, I love the program that they have. I just, I don't know if I could be voting them into the top 25 or, or raising them that high. I think it's fair, names. Dave. I think that uh, for me, like, let's say that my, that I had a decision to make between uh, I'm going to kind of make this up, but like a rebuilding Platteville and a John Carroll, I, I would go Platteville because of their recent history and feeling like that's a better bet. Um, but look, Carroll can come out of the gates here and, 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 and show us real quickly. They can get themselves in that poll pretty darn easily. Oh, absolutely. I mean, if they go and yeah. show it in the first couple of weeks that they're a buzzkill yeah. or a buzz killer and, and they're going to come through and just annihilate teams. Yeah, they're, they're in. Uh, they're just a team. I, they're on that list of teams that I need to see something. I don't feel I can just put them into the preseason right. top 25 based on just, right. Um, hey, we got so-and-so. Akiva, wow. NESCAC, I want to talk about where we are with the NESCAC because you brought up Middlebury. We brought up Williams earlier. So Akiva, when, when we're at the final poll and you're, you know, on that Sunday night making your final ballot, do you think you'll be riding Middlebury ahead of Williams or Williams ahead of, uh, ahead of Middlebury? Who's going to have the better season? Uh, in my uh, Williams, if I were to guess, I mean, obviously no one, no one knows. Right. But uh, if you just compare the two teams in terms of what they bring back, what they looked like last year, um, and then also throw in the fact that Williams not only has tournament experience now, uh, but also that they have to deal with the COVID situation. So it's not like they had a pure perfect season last year, and they still fought through that situation. Um, I, I think in certain spots, Middlebury is better. Um, I think Williams is deeper. Um, and I think in terms of the starting five, I like their starting five better. Um, I, obviously, uh, in if we're talking head to head, a lot of things will depend on foul trouble um, with with Sobel. I mean, because I mean that's how it always goes, right? Right. Um, but in terms of a team which I like to go deeper into the tournament, um, and that's all I can really think about because I mean, if you're talking about 10 games, who knows how they go? I would go Williams because of their depth. And Ryan Scott, let me ask you, 
uh, Williams one, Middlebury two seems kind of where the group is is uh, talking about. Do you see the NESCAC, Ryan, any any differently? And is there like a third team that's knocking on the door right there? I mean, not to start. I think Trinity could be pretty good. Um, I know there's a lot of people higher than me on Wesleyan. I mean, obviously, I mean, the NESCAC is going to be talented all the way through because they're getting lots of great players. They're great schools. They're great programs. You know, I mean, I think Tufts could challenge, but I, I think Williams and Middlebury, at least to start the year based on what they did last year and who's coming back are the two teams you have to talk about first. Yeah. Um, whether it ends up that way. I mean, <laughs> they only played 10 conference games, so who knows how it ends <laughs> up, right? So absolutely. Anyone else on the NESCAC? It, it feels like we're in a much, we're, we're in a pretty similar place. Anything else on the NESCAC before it's, I move on? It's wide open and we haven't mentioned Amherst. Yeah, that's pretty I, crazy. I, I mean, I, I think they're going to be in that, that, that fight. I think, I think Sears has got a program kind of put together and kind of the rough spots that they had in the transition out of Hickson they did during the pandemic. So not that they're out of it, but you know, during the shutdown and stuff. So I I think you got to watch out for them. I I think the rest of the conference has gotten deeper than we've ever listen. The NESCAC's always had teams at the bottom. You're like, Oh, okay. And then, you know, the top six is always a battle. This might go eight. This might go 10. I, I think this NESCAC is much deeper and much more wide open than we're used to. Agree. Yeah, I, th- I think we have a pretty good feel on the NESCAC and probably where the, the front is, the top is on paper, but I think there could be a lot of depth there in the middle and the, the quote but, bottom. Before we get too far, Bob, away from it, I just looked up John Carroll's schedule because I hadn't looked at it yet. And they start Wittenberg, Ohio Wesleyan, River Falls, and then potentially Wheaton. Wow. as their first four games so we're going to know quite a bit we're about them know. by thanksgiving so. i was going to say so by thanksgiving we may be giving <laughs> thanks to john carroll sorry yeah, absolutely cheesy. um let me yeah. go let me throw let me find a neutral party to ask this question i think i'm going to go to ryan whitnable ryan whitnable the college conference of illinois and wisconsin um interesting season aren't we all in. Uh, a neutral other than you sir C- correct i mean i just <laughs> picked one i picked one of the neutral guys um, Ryan, Ryan W, how do you assess what is a confusing CCIW picture based on losses? Like, how are you trying to sort out the top of the league right now? Yeah, um, this is one of those leagues, and I know we'll get into this as well with the UAA, where you look at the top three or four teams from last year, and there's a great reshuffling uh, in that conference. Uh, Wheaton lost a ton. Um, I know North Central uh, is is you know, installing a new coach. Um, Illinois Wesleyan, for me, as I dig through the CCIW, still looks to be on paper the most talented team in that conference. And, and that's why I think I've slotted them for that number one spot. Um, as far as where does IWU fit in the, the national picture, I think that remains to be seen. Um, I, I think we need to see some games played. Uh, but as I start the year, I, I think you have to start with, with Illinois Wesleyan at the top. And then maybe, uh, you know, looking down through the, 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 the middle and the bottom half of that conference last year for, for teams that could make that jump up into the top of the conference this year, Augustana uh, is a program that's, that's had a couple of, of years, uh, I think, lower than, than they're used to. They were, a, you know, a really dominant team back yeah, four, five years ago. Um, I know Jesse is, is building, trying to build that program, program back up to the expectation level that they have. And, and they're a team that, when I look at what they bring back this year, could make that jump back into uh, the title race this year. Akiva, how about on, on your end? I, I know that you've done a great job following all the leagues, but the CCIW is in a weird place with all, everything that Elmhurst, Wheaton, Illinois, Wesleyan lost. Like, how do you sort out? There's probably a team in there that, that you'll vote for, but I, I mean, how do you pick who that's going to be? Like, what are your thoughts on the CCIW here? Yeah, uh, it's a crapshoot. I mean, I'm leaning, if there's one team, just like Ryan, I'm leaning IWU just because of, I I know in terms of the recruiting, the depth of the talent that they've recruited, even though we didn't get to see it so much last year because, you know, they lost a lot of guys who are taking up all all the big minutes. So we didn't really get to see how good some of these guys really were. In terms of the talent, it's, it's there, probably. Elmhurst, I mean, I, apparently they have some transfers coming in. North Central brings back their uh, potential All-American. Sure, Matt um, Helwig. Yes, big uh, big debate last year about if he was an All-American. Um, 
I'm sure he'll want to cement himself there this year. And then uh, there's other teams as well. I mean, frankly, I probably defer to you in terms of the. And I don't know. I, I don't know what specifics in terms of recruiting because that's kind of what you're getting down to here. It's like I, all these teams are putting three new guys, or almost all these teams are putting three new guys on the floor. Um, you know, there are some returning pieces like Dan Carr's back and Helwig's back. So we kind of know how good those guys are, but the pieces around them, do we really know? Um, it's it's one of those things where it's like, okay, the preseason poll, I tried my best. I put Wesley in there or whatever. I put Elmer's there. I don't know. And then once the games happen, then yeah. it'll be a lot easier. Ryan Scott, how about on, on your end? How do you handle a league like that where, you know, it's a good league. It's a league that usually has a couple teams in, but you, you, you literally don't know like who to put in there. Like, how do you handle that in the pre? Do you just skip the league and say, I'll get back to you in a week? Or, or what do you do with that? Well, I mean, I think uh, Augustana, North Central have a little bit to prove. Um, they've got all the talent, right, in the world, but in that league and and even outside, right, in the non-conference, everybody's gunning for the CCIW teams. you got to be able to prove it on the floor, and you might see maybe a little more like Elmhurst that somebody's coming together at the end of the year, putting it together because they've had to take all the lumps early on. But the one I'm intrigued by, and I'm not saying a guarantee because we just talked about the trouble with transfers, but the guys that Wheaton is bringing in, yeah. if you look at the resume, I think they got four grad transfers coming in. Mm -hmm. They're all guys who are like four-year starters, team captains, you know, like all character kind of guys. And, and they're good, right? And so Absolutely. if that goes well with four leaders coming in as grad transfers on a team that really is only losing one or two, I mean, big guys, but, but a lot of the team returning, like, you, I could really see them winning this league outright if everything falls the right way, right? They I think have, there's a lot of potential on that, right? and nobody's have, really talked about it yet. They have very talented additions. I think that um, Elmhurst has more returning than than people realize. When you when you think of they have Ocean Johnson and Wesley Hooker and Jonathan Sabinski, um, I think that you've got uh, Augustana has Dan Carr. Um, DMAC, on, on your end, just before we move on from the CCIW, how do you handle a league like that where you don't know how to separate between all the teams coming in? Do you, do you go with your gut on something? Do you skip the league and get back to it? Or how do you handle that? I say this feeling like it's a little bit of a dangerous thing to say, but I think the CCIW is a type of league that you can't necessarily skip. Like, I don't want to say you always write in teams from conferences into the top 25. I don't want that to be the message, but I don't think the CCIW is the type of conference that you can ignore or you can skip over and say, there's no way anybody here is in my preseason top 25. That said, my biggest challenge is the fact that the top three were great and everybody else was, eh, which was really strange last season. Now, granted conference records were a little bit tighter, but when you look at the difference between in the wins and losses, North Central was the had uh, the fourth best record overall at 17 and 10. Everybody else was 22, 24, 27 above them. And everybody else was dreadfully below that. So I think it's really hard to pinpoint, okay, if you're better, Augustana, if you're better, North Central, if you're better, Carthage, how much better are you? And does that actually bridge that gap that developed last year yeah. between that top three and the rest. And that I think is the challenge. So going into my top 25, obviously I got to compare them to everybody else, but if Illinois Wesley or if Wheaton, for example, as you said, is bringing in that kind of talent and it stands out to me and I'm looking at them, I'm going to take one that we mentioned earlier versus a keen state. I think I've got to weigh that, you know, maybe a little bit more towards, Hey, I know what Mike has done at, at Wheaton and I know what they can do every year. Yes. I know what Keen can do, but look at what they got. Look what Keen has. And that's where that conversation will that's come down to me. Um, I, I think it'd be hard to skip the CCIW altogether in the preseason, but at the same time, as you point out, I think this might be the hardest season it's been in a long time to try and gauge those teams. Yeah. My take is that it's, it's going to be confusing at the beginning, but by, by the time we get to January, you're going to have the same collection of, of top teams. Now I'm not saying the names will be the same, but um, I, you mentioned Wheaton could be really good if these transfers pan out and Illinois Wesleyan's got this pipeline of, of really good kids that have been sitting there on the JV team, ready to kind of step in with some other guys. And Augustana has got an all American player North central 
as an all American player and Milliken's going to be a lot better this year than they have been the last decade or so. So when you look at, when you look at the CCIW, I think so you're going to have to make a leap of faith and then you're going to have to watch some ball games. That, that's kind of my take. Um, let's go to the league that is uh, geographically pretty darn close to the CCIW. Ryan Scott, the, the WIAC, we met, we mentioned Oshkosh. I think we all love Oshkosh coming into this season. Are there other teams? Obviously, this is a, a multiple top 25 team usually or league usually. Are there other teams in the in the WIAC that you're looking at, Ryan, this year coming in? Um, I mean, I think there's going to be good teams, whether there's someone who's immediately challenging Oshkosh, I'm less sure about. Um, lacrosse took a summer trip, right? Was it lacrosse that did? I always factor those in. Um, it's invaluable, the chance for those guys to bond in another country and to play those games. Um, I, I would pencil any team that takes a foreign trip in for an extra three wins, you know, like, I mean, that's, it, it just really helps. And in a league like that, it can make a huge difference. Right. When it when half the conference games are five point games, you know, that chemistry and that extra work in the summer can can pay dividends. Um, I would have had Whitewater up there. Tragically, Derek Gray died this summer. Um, just a shocking sort of development. Yeah. And beyond just losing an all American talent, um, the emotions of playing without him for a year. I mean, we saw that right. Um, you know, with Wash U, they're going to be playing, <laughs> losing a guy this year and having, you know, essentially dying during the season last year. Um, you know, that you just never know how that is going to, uh, how right. that's going to play out. And so, you know, and, and, and Platteville, I think is always really good. Um, they have some questions as well, but I think it's Oshkosh and then whether one of those other teams can step up and, and, and get there. And I hear Stevens points bringing in quite a few transfers, several, um, yeah. and you can't really count them out, even when they don't have a great, team um he's going to have them ready to play so yeah i think as i look at the the wyack you know oshkosh is one of the programs that is that is in great position as a program you can kind of figure that every year that matt's going to have them in the conversation i think platteville is now also back to that as well lacrosse you know with ethan anderson coming back i mean that's three really good teams walking in the front door this year Oshkosh Platteville across we don't know how Whitewater responds to to tragedy here um, I've, I've had a lot of people tell me that I can't remember if it's Stout or River Falls or both that they have significant stud transfers and then Stevens Point has a bunch so YX the YAC but Ryan Whitnable are you like Wash or Oshkosh at the top and then someone else second how, how do you sort out like I don't know one or two in the YAC at this stage I think Oshkosh has to be at the top when we start the conversation here. Um, I think, you know, as we were talking about the top 25, you were talking about, you know, the CCIW being one of those conferences where, you know, we may not know the names of the teams who are going to be in the conversation, but we can count on the CCIW for having two or three teams in that top 25 conversation. I think the WIAC is the most classic example of, we just know that there are going to be two, three, four teams that are going to be at that elite level. Um, and, and for me, you know, when we get past Oshkosh, I think you have to lean on, as, as you said, the names that I think we've grown accustomed to in the last couple of years. We can assume that Platteville is going to be a solid program. Um, I think we can count on lacrosse to be a solid program. Um, I believe the first game for lacrosse is at Marietta. Uh, so you can circle that one on your on your calendar. Uh, that's awesome. a good one to start the season. Um, Long drive. <laughs> it is. Yeah. Um, but that'll be a fun one to start the year. And uh I think the WIAC again is going to prove itself to be probably the deepest, most consistent conference again. Akiva, before we move on from the, the WIAC, any uh, any additional thoughts to add? I'm going to ask Dave the same thing about the Wisconsin Intercollegiate here. Yeah, so um, with the cross, you brought up Ethan Anderson, but I mean, around him, they lose a lot of firepower. Yep. Um, Cook's gone, his brother, um, Seth is gone. I think socomel has gone too, so... I mean, it'll be up to the other pieces. Can they, you know, do something there? And then with Platteville, they lose Shields and Puma, um, Stovall. They lose so a lot. Th yeah. So they have Pearson still. So he's probably going to be the main guy. But, I mean, who knows what happens there. And then um, with Whitewater, in addition to um, the tragedy with Gray, um, Gage Malinsek, 
uh, left. So I hope he gets everything in order. I know he's had some issues in the past, um, but that I there can be situations where a team can ride off of tragedy and do something special, but I don't think they have the pieces. Yeah, well, well said. I think that's a good depiction of kind of where things stand coming in. And then they DMAC, I mean, the names change from year to year, but when we were doing this 20 years ago, we were talking about Stevens Point and whoever, and here we are, you know, the Wyack's the Wyack. How do you look at this league coming in? You mentioned him. I've got my eye on lacrosse. I, I, and and if there's a sleeper there, it's River Falls. Um, and I And I say River Falls not from a basketball program standpoint. I say that from a department wide standpoint their their football team is having a bonkers year this year narrow loss to st john's and got a win over platteville just the other day uh their soccer program women's soccer they don't have men's their women's soccer programs having a really good season this year they're one to just keep an eye on there's something just going on at river falls in general i think yeah. but lacrosse is a team that i think what he has been able to do there and get them into this conversation and keep them there bear it's bearing fruit and 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 it's he's only getting better there. I'm really impressed with how that program's turned around, and I and I think they're the one to really watch. To maybe I don't know if they can. I agree with all of you about Oshkosh. I think they're going to be really hard to knock off. But maybe it's lacrosse that's too. When as Platteville kind of retools. Yeah, that's fair. Quick quick point about Stevens Point. Remember, they're still, if not in, coming out of all the sanctions that got leveled regarding the the illegal practices and then everything that went with that and so great they got transfers they're still struggling in the recruiting front that's clearly there that's clearly there because they have not had the programs we're used to now is the time to start gauging can they recover from that and really step forward or did it hurt so much that they are now kind of stuck in that bottom five, in that bottom group. I'm looking forward to seeing them. And Akiva, I don't know if you're making your way to Bloomington uh, November 12th and 13th, but Stevens Point will be there. And I'm looking forward to seeing how they look with their new team and their new players. So that's going to be interesting right off the bat. Um, Ryan Scott, the UAA, I mean, again, I said this earlier, but wow. I know some of the teams lost a bunch, but still, when you think of the collection of teams, Emory, Rochester, Case, Wash U, maybe just as a starting point here. Uh, what's your take, Ryan Scott, on the UAA uh, heading into like the preseason poll? Um, I'm I'm big on Rochester, um, Algier coming back. Um, you know, a, a full year off essentially. Uh, they thought he'd be back last January. It, you know, he was around a little bit, but not the same. And I, I mean, if he can recover you know, 70% of what he was before the injury. It was a pretty crazy injury. And when you're that big, it's, it's hard for any, <laughs> any leg injury. Um, but just the defensive presence and just a really smart passer and, and the offense, they run the ball movement, the defense. I mean, he's just a key part of all of that. Yeah. Um, and they've got a ton of experience, you know, uh, I, I'm really high on them. Um, I don't know if we've seen an official case roster yet to know everybody who's coming in. Uh, there's the rumors that, that the transfers are going to be big impact. And so maybe they end up number one um, and then wash you loaded with talent. We just don't know how they respond to all the stuff they've been through the last year and a half. Um, I would say early on those three, I would put kind of just slightly ahead of, you know, like Emery and, and Carnegie Mellon. Um, but I, this is, you know, it seemed like two years ago we were talking about how down the UAA was, right? And now all of a sudden they're just yeah, loaded. Right back at, at, at the top. Ryan Whitnable, UAA, you've looked at it quite a bit. And and you've got another team to throw into the conversation that I am I am all about because I think they have a stud player. Um, talk a little bit about the UAA, Ryan, and kind of that that team you want to throw onto the table there. Well, I'll start at the top and I'll agree with with Dave and Ryan uh, on their assessments of Case Western. I think if there's a year where Case Western can can 
uh, be towards that top or, or make a run for a regular season championship, this might be the year for Case Western um, with, with all the guys coming in and the guys coming back and the success they had in the tournament last year. I think they'll be looking to build off of that success and, and kind of continuing that um, this year. Uh, a team, though, I'm looking at further down that was uh, – I got a chance to see them quite a few times last year and was really impressed. Um, you, you look at their final win loss record and, and you may not be impressed, but Carnegie Mellon, um, you know, they got maybe one of the best under the radar players in the national scene in RJ Holmes. Um, as I said, they were really competitive in a lot of games last year that, that, that just didn't go their way in the end, but they bring almost everyone back off of that team. Um, you know, when we, when we talk about teams being close, you know, when, when everyone grows up a year and you, you get that chemistry continuing on, those losses can turn to wins and, and you have a team that can make a big jump uh, in just a season. So Carnegie Mellon, I, I think, is in the mix. And then, of course, you know, Wash U is, is, is always Wash U. I know they've got some transfers as well. Um, I think those are the three we'll be talking about. I'm with you on RJ Holmes. I think he was a guy that got lost in the shuffle of a lot of uh, older stud players in that same conference. But he is a fantastic player. They have several guys around him. Akiva. Um, any any other thoughts on the UAA that, that we didn't bring up here? Yeah, I think in terms of the one-two, it really comes down for me to how much Algier is healed. Um, if he's near 100%, they're probably number one. Um, they lose Membolino Perez. They lose Trent Nordich, who uh, I think was one of the underrated premier defenders um, in the UAA. Um, but... Messino is back for his second transfer year, and then Ross Gang is back, so that's big points. Um, and then with Case Western, I think it's Prendergast who's back, but maybe not a couple of the other grad transfers. But they no, got that's Fraunheim. who it is. It's, it's Prendergast. Yep, it's Prendergast, and then they got Fraunheim from Susquehanna. Um, so I'm and not Case as can, high. Case can really yeah. score. The, the, the oh, thing yeah. with Case, oh, yeah. if you watch them. They have interchangeable parts on the floor that can shoot the daylights out of it. It seems like they always have like a bunch of six, four guys that can move and shoot. So they're dangerous. I'm with you on Rochester. I'm probably on, if I had to vote in the poll, the, the highest UAA uh, today, I'd have Rochester. I'm kind of on that wagon for sure. Um, I like the Carnegie pick from Ryan W. I tell you the, the, the balance in the league when you, we haven't even talked about Chicago Brandeis NYU. So think of these road games. We're on a Sunday, you're playing at Brandeis or, or at NYU or Chicago, and you're the leader, you know, the league is going to be phenomenal. DMAC, you've, you followed the UAA forever and it hasn't always been a year like this, but it seems like we're coming into a UAA year that's loaded. No, I, I was going to say the same. The, I was going to mention the teams we hadn't talked about, and you mentioned them. The Brandeis Chicago's and NYU's. Uh, Brandeis showed now under their new coaching, and I say new, it's been a few years, that they have figured something out there, and they're back into the conversation. NYU's had a coaching change that, I'll be honest, I think needed to happen. I think they need a, a kind of a jolt. So I don't know if they're going to be it this year, but they're going to be in their new place. And so how does that impact teams that have never played there? And how does that impact the team that they get to play in one place for right. pretty much the entire season? And, and then Chicago, McGrath's always got a team that is tough. They bring back a lot of what made them pretty decent last year. You know, we talked about the CCIW, the, the top three, and then there was a big drop-off. UAA didn't have that. The McGrath's team was at 10 and 15 last year, the worst team uh, overall. 10 and 15, there's a lot of teams that would die to be 10 and 15 in the, in the end of the season, especially going through the UAA. No, I think this is going to be, this is going to be a much watch on Sunday because you've got the travel in there and who's going to be able to take advantage of home court. You've got, you know, again, an Emory, can they, can they roost at home in the, in, in Atlanta and then not trip and fall somewhere else? And can, can case Western take the load? And last year they came on kind of, you know, I started talking about them, in early January, but no one really talked about them till late February. Can they now take the full season view of that? I think the UAA is going to be fun to watch this year. And it's because it is going to be a little bit more jumbled. It's not going to be the same suspects every single week. Right. And it's going to make those Sunday games even more exciting, or maybe even the Friday, because everyone's looking at the yep. Sunday. Just uh, before we wrap up, just a little bit of a speed round, trying to get as, as many mentions as we can of teams that we feel are pretty darn relevant at this point in no particular order. Um, Ryan Whitnable, 
wanted to ask about the NCAC. You know, Worcester Wittenberg traditionally last year, Wabash gets to the final four. Ohio Wesleyan had the run back a few years ago for several years. Um, I know it's early and I'm putting you on the spot here. Any sense of who's the favorite this year in the NCAC? Whoop, you're on mute, Ryan. You know, Wabash won that conference by, by several games last year. Um, and they obviously lose quite a bit at the top. I think they lose their top three scores off of that team. I still think they're in the title conversation. I think they bring back enough that they're going to be in that title race. The team I'm, I'm watching it and probably considering picking at the top of that conference, though, is Ohio Wesleyan again. Um, yeah. Coach DeWitt has, you know, they, they were dominant for, for several years there. And I, I feel like that program kind of had to go through a cycle of, of a little bit of down um, but they, you know, they were, they were a pretty good team last year. They, they brought everyone back off of that team. And I think, you know, they're going to be in the conversation this year. Uh, I think Worcester will be in the conversation. The one that I'm, I'm, I'm a little unsure about at this point is Wittenberg. Um, you know, Wittenberg is the winningest program in division three basketball. Uh, but the last couple of years have just kind of been a, a little bit of a walkabout for the program. And, and I'm not sure, um, coming into this year, if, if I, what to expect from them this year again. So, um, Interesting times in, in, in Springfield there, but I think Ohio Wesleyan is my pick with, with Wabash a close second. I'm going to tackle the Northwest Conference and invite any other thoughts. I, I think Whitworth is the program that is on the most solid footing currently. Where Whit Whitman went through the coaching change. Otherwise, we'd still be talking about them right there. It seems like Whitworth coming in, if I'm going to, if I'm going to gamble on who's got the best odds, I like Whitworth. I think Whitman's ready to contend now. So I, th I think Whitman, I, I like what they return. There's a, um, there's another team. I really like a Pacific Lutheran uh, and, and I'll throw Linfield out there. I think there, there's a really good top four in the Northwest conference. And uh, probably in terms of voting, I, Whitworth would probably get my vote coming into the year. I don't know if I'd vote for a second, but I'd be close. Um, anyone else on Northwest conference in terms of uh, thoughts coming into the season? Okay. I think the I think the SIAC is better than the Northwest Conference right now. Yeah. So Akiva, I was going to go there next. So we talked about the the SIAC earlier. Pomona Pitzer, like who's the? I have not yeah. dug into the SIAC. I think it's Pomona Pitzer. Are they the favorite it's, coming in? Pitzer's going to be in my top twenty five. I don't know where. Maybe ten. Maybe twenty five. I have no clue. But they, I think they have to be the favorite coming in. They had Elmhurst uh, down double digits at halftime at Elmhurst in the uh the sweet was it the sweet 16 or was it round two i can't remember i guess it was round it's round two yeah yeah i mean the, elmhurst was in a lot of trouble in that game john would be the first to tell you i think they'll be better this year than they were last year they're bringing back yeah. young guys who are really good um i think redlands has more guys coming back than we thought right because they had a bunch of seniors and i think a, a few of those guys had an extra year yeah for so, them it's just a matter of can they can they gel under bridgeland you know can can they can that can that system that bridgeland tore down that program that he tore down, build up and be competitive. I think they got surprised last year. I think a lot of people, especially maybe Eric himself, thought they were going to be a little more competitive in the conference, and they weren't. Right. Well, and that's, I think, the difference between the Northwest Conference and the SCIAC is that Northwest Conference, you got a lot of system teams that don't have the same sort of level of individual talent. And those Southern California schools, you got some really talented guys. And I think Redlands has an extra step maybe to, to overcome – some of those individual scorers um, in a way that they didn't, you know, Bridgeland's system did not have to deal with up there at women. Mm -hmm. So, well, we definitely agree that the, the Skyac and the Northwest conference, and I don't know that they had to close the gap. Maybe it was just a perceived gap, but those teams have proven they can play in the last five years or so they've trotted out good teams into the tournament every year. Um, again, no particular centennial. Um, I have not done my homework yet. And I can't remember if we have a Swarthmore year, a Hopkins year, or I got one you got to watch for. Talk to me. And I'm a little biased because I probably going to be calling some of their games. I think Gettysburg might be worth watching. You're stealing my thunder there. Dave. Sorry, man. I jumped in. Gettysburg. No, I think Gettysburg is the one to watch. Yeah. Hopkins has lost a bit. I think they're still going to be competitive. I, I think what Gettysburg. he's built at, at Hopkins is, is dynamite, but Gettysburg something about is Gettysburg good. has just been kind of, and again, I, I might be lucky enough to call some of their games this year. Um, so I'm looking forward to seeing them up close. I, I'm, 
I don't know what to make of Swarthmore, to be honest. You know, they came back after the pandemic. Everyone thought they had kind of cracked the system, as it were, to get everybody back and then didn't have the season we expected, which I guess should have been known because there was such a time off and guys are older and all that. I don't know. Kozmowski's great, so I'm, I'm never going to write them off. Well, so and the Centennial might be deeper. And they've got change. some really interesting recruits coming in that I don't know whether they'll be good or not, but right. there's some real potential there. Right. Um, and they're also scheduling better this year. Yes. They're bringing some teams in. And so it's not just going to be the, you know, the whoever's nearby anymore. Right. Um, the question becomes, does, does the, I guess the middle-ish to the bottom part of that conference improve themselves enough to give those top teams enough of a battle right. to make them better. And I think that's always been the problem with the Centennial the last few years. Swarthmore got over it, but it could it can't be the Swarthmore Hopkins show in the Centennial if they want to achieve great things. Totally agree. Yeah. That's there's got to really be another one or two teams in there that's going to chip at them. And there's got to be a couple at the bottom who are going to sting them. You and it can't be McDaniel because Hopkins struggles or Swarthmore struggles to play at McDaniel. It can't be that. It's got to be a Dickinson. It's got to be or McDaniel's got to be a whole great program. It, it can't be just an occasional thing. And that's the thing to watch with Gettysburg. Are they in this conversation? Has Coach Dunn been able to build enough there? And there are signs he has, but as we talk about Carol and we talk about others, we got to see it on the floor too. When Gettysburg yeah. cuts down the nets this year, folks, remember where <laughs> well, you heard it. I will. It may stole it from there. Ryan. Well, it may be one more year because they were all freshmen right. last year. No, but, it, it might still be another but year. A, but you know, they've got ten or twelve guys that are all six three to six five, long, athletic. You know, but, and and they know how to play. And so, but it also may not back be to this the River year, but, Falls conversation. This is in the water there. You know, you've got soccer programs that are that are getting better men's i think was in the top 25 or still is in the top 25 the lacrosse programs have certainly always been in the conversation in the national scope especially women they're a powerhouse there this is in, and then women's basketball we, we've talked about women's basketball at gettysburg for years this is in the water there and there's an effort on campus their ad got experience at hopkins they want to take this evolutionary step and so now I think we're starting to see that and we'll see what, where it may develop. It's a good point. And I think those are very relevant leading indicators when an athletic program demonstrates success across different sports, uh, usually says that something's going awfully well in the building there. Uh, Akiva, um, the, the NJAC, I want to ask you, your guys played at the NJAC last year um, in their building, at least uh, Stockton. Do, do we look at Stockton coming in? As the NJAC favorite, I don't mean to pick on you that like, like you've done a bunch yeah. of research, but I think no Stockton's worries. the team, right? Stockton's the team. Uh, actually, in my preparation, they were one of my teams, which has to be on the top 25 radar. Um, and I was going to warn to not be too high on them. Um, maybe um, Ryan W. Would, would share that warning just because he didn't see a good Stockton. Um, the issue with Stockton is that I don't know how, if there's they're on that supreme level of talent, what they are is extremely athletic. And so I think their turnover differential last year was almost five. So they're not, they're not creating the greatest shots. They're not hitting at the greatest rate, but they're getting so many possessions that they're beating teams that way. And I think right. they return basically everyone. Um, so they've got to be at the top there. And then Rowan also, I think, returns most guys. And, yeah. and they were right there with Stockton. Um, so they should be there as well. And they play, the they play Swath more opening night. Rowan does. So oh, that's that'll, great. Be, that'll be helpful to see. The best yeah. thing for us is these the, the games that start to pit good teams versus good teams. And I think we will find there's even more of those this year. I thought last year was great. I think there's even more of those this year as some of the teams that were playing weaker schedules have scheduled really tough. And uh, so I can't wait for that. Um, and Bob, Bob, I would also point out, Bob, that um, in the Centennial, um, for Hopkins, that Quarry and Bartlett are back for grad years. Um, that's big. So I think they only lose Delaney, and Thibault is already so good and is just going to get better. And he really, he can he can kill you. His wingspan is, is I mean, Yeshiva saw it firsthand, how it, how it killed, how, how it, hurt their ability to get looks close to the basket. 
but just because he altered shots or potential shots just by being there. Um, and then with Swarthmore, a, a quick point on them. Um, last year they had so much depth, but they were missing the the depth at forward that they had in their near championship winning season. Um, and so Landry kind of had to pull back a little bit on some of the things that he was doing. He kind of molded to the talent as opposed to, to the system and it didn't really work so well for him. Um, so I'm not sure the the new talent that they have coming in this year. I'm sure Ryan's going to have one well, of this. I'm not, you go ahead, Ryan. There's some big guys, but I just yeah. reminds me that I did an interview with Landry at some point and I asked him, what are the stats that he worries about? You know, they, cause they spent years leading the country and rebounding and rebounding margin and all that. And he said, I don't really care that much about rebounds, which he said before the two all American guys left. And I think he cares <laughs> a lot more about rebounds now yeah. than he did maybe two years ago. Um, yeah. And I think they're going to pay more attention to that. Um, they've got a, a number of big guys coming in. Now, I don't know whether they're good or not. I know nothing about them, but they've got a lot of size coming the in. The other thing to watch about Swarthmore, they're the ones who bought in on this shoot the three-pointer, not the mid-range shot thing. You look at a shot sheet from a game of Swarthmore, and it's everything outside the arc, everything inside the little tiny circle. There's <laughs> yeah. nothing in the middle. And, and so can yeah. they take that big talent and be able to still shoot from outside? And we'll say for all the Midwestern folks who may not be looking, Sidney Teibel has everything you would want to be the best player in the country. Whether he puts it all together or not is up to him, obviously. But he has all the physical tools, the mental ability, yeah. defense, offense. It's all there if he can put it together. I mean, he is a really, really, really talented guy. Here, here's what I'd say, guys, is um, I, I think we've broken this down – here on October 12th is about as well as we can do it. Now I know that people are going to tune into this thing. You didn't mention this team and this team, and we're aware of that. <laughs> we've, uh, we've tried to cover a good sampling. I think we've covered a good sampling of the country, you know, from East, West, North, South. Um, certainly we've left a lot of teams out that are going to be in, in the picture. And we've put some in there that are going to end up not in the picture. Um, but this has been awesome. I'd like to just do a quick, uh, speed round kind of final thoughts kind of thing from from all of you guys and really i'd just like to know kind of you're going to be voting in the poll in the next uh, well, let's call it a week and a half or so somewhere in there um what are you the what are you most looking forward to in kind of that balloting process i'll start with akiva well looking forward to her um looking i mean you're kind of looking forward to it but also dreading i guess um it's for me this year, and this wasn't the case at the beginning of the season last year, but for me this year, it's the fact that there are a lot of, and we touched on it, a lot of conferences in which I'm not really sure who the one, or I'm not sure who the two is, and we know it's a good conference historically, and because of the transfer situations and the losses, but the depth of talents or the other varying situations which teams have, uh, I, what I think is going to happen is a lot of voters are going to rely on conference preseason polls if they come out on time. And if they don't, they're just going to guess. Yeah. Uh, which for a preseason poll isn't really a bad strategy because, I mean, it's there's a, a big difference between um, making assumptions as to how good teams are going to be versus seeing how good they actually are. Um, so I think that's what I'm, I guess I'm dreading most that trying to find that balance between teams, which I know are, are deserve to be in the picture. And I know what they're bringing back teams like uh, Stockton or Keen state and, you know, teams where I don't right. really know. How about Ryan Whitnable? Ryan, your, your kind of thoughts as you start to prepare a ballot. Yeah, I think, I think Akiva hit it right on the head. I think there's an excitement about the season starting, but as a voter, you know, I know how hard it is on a Sunday afternoon and a Sunday evening when we have 10 to 15 games under our belt. Uh, doing this process, doing it this year with, with you know, at this point with no practices and, and no games being played, I think this is especially um, going to be difficult. So I, I think there's going to be to a point leaning on the, the teams and the programs that have proved themselves year after year um, that have kind of proven that consistency. Um you, you kind of lean on them a little bit more in the preseason process. And I think that that transitions out as we begin to see games played and um, as we get some actual results and some data to, to sift through. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to, you know, the practice starting. I'm excited to hopefully get out to a couple of uh, scrimmages and exhibitions over the next couple of weeks. Uh, and I'm excited for November. 
Appreciate it, Ryan. Ryan Scott, how about your thoughts as we get closer here? Well, there haven't been no practices, right? Whether there been four, right, poppers? Uh, uh, all at Yeshiva, Yeshiva all had of... had one like open tryout and four practices. Okay. So yes. All right. Um that that was a the school's out of session for some holidays, which is why they got to start early in case anyone's wondering. It's right. not nothing a, illegal, nothing not changed. an illegal situation going on there. But what I look forward to with the preseason is you know, you got 10 to 15 teams that you want to recognize for what they can do. And then the last 10, you know, there's probably a hundred teams that could fit into that 10 spot. Right. And what I love doing is picking a team that might be off the radar, especially early, because what this preseason poll will do is get their name out there. Right. And then other people will take a look at them. Um, one of the things I'm not sure that I won't live to regret it, but I think the Liberty league is going to be super good this year. Right. I think they've got a lot of really good teams up there. And so, you know, and there's a number of places across the country that you can take a flyer on this first poll because you can justify it based on what's on paper. And we haven't seen any games yet. And so um, it's hard to do, but it's also my favorite one because um, you, you don't have to justify anything, right? Um, th there's no evidence to go on. Um, and, and that's a lot of fun. DMAC, you've submitted a lot of preseason ballots um, over the years. Um, you're, you're on the cusp, uh, again, of being asked to do that. Um, a week and a half, two weeks, whatever it's going to be. What are, you, what are your final thoughts, Dave? It's my least favorite ballot. Um, as much as I might be excited about a season, trying to understand either the way too much minutia that is shared or the way too little details that is not shared is just you know annoying and i resist the urge every year to start making phone calls and calling around to different people and get their gauge on it because you know it, it's not fair to them and it's not going to help me as much as I, I expect it to and i always end up taking either too much time or too little time i never feel like I, i'm settled on it I, i'm excited for the season but i i think the top 25 vote is going to be um wide open I, we're going to probably have a lot of people getting votes um Hopefully we get a lot of information from teams so that we can gauge it as best we can on top of everything else that we've read through the tea leaves. So I'm looking forward to it as much as I'm dreading it, because it also means the season's here. And, and it means we get to, you know, for the first time since 2019, kind of buckle up and, and feel comfortable, as Ryan mentioned earlier, about what's ahead of us. And we've got an exciting season ahead. I mean, there's there's a couple little nuances and things here and there, you know, a day between championships, uh, the semifinals and championship game this year. How does that manifest itself for the championship game this year? But on top of that, you know, this might be the last time we're dealing with weeks by November or I'm sorry, by January, we may be talking about the fact that D three passed days in a season and that coaches can right. use them in September if they want to, as long as they don't use them somewhere else. And so, you know, we're, we're kind of turning a corner in division three here. Uh, men's basketball has gotten deeper. I'll, I'll shout out women's basketball real quick. Cause it's gotten deeper. Uh, as well. And I'm looking forward to it. And, and as much as I'm treading the top 25 vote while well, my brain's not completely in it, cause I'm into baseball and soccer and still have my eye on football. It, it also means it's exciting. We get to buckle up and have some fun. And Dave, uh, before we let you go, we need to ask, cause it's come up on Twitter a couple of times. Do you have a general sense of when you'll get the Hoopsville machine cranked up? Uh, you uh, don't need an exact answer, but any ballpark. Yeah. Sometime between now and uh, new year's Eve. Okay. Um, that's pretty wide <laughs> kind of like my, my no, ballot really i am debating a little bit on, on the exact start point but i i'd like to get a show somewhere around the mm -hmm. first day I, I, we can go into a rant about the hack i don't like where we start our season i will say that i think we start the season too early i think the idea of where they moved it was too much and we need to back it off but that's not something i can change but somewhere around the 10th of november maybe before that we'll get our first show out the door hopefully back to what we did in the past of doing two shows a week uh i want to say two hours a show but i'll be honest with you i'm toying with adding some different segments to kind of change up the show a little bit don't know if that will lengthen it or not it, it depends you you add this and take away others and and that's where it's tricky and you guys know the show used to be very simple. We had four regions in one show, four regions in another. It was very, very easy to do. Well, now with five and five, it's much harder. And so I'm not sure how we figure that out even after a year under our belt. But by my count, this is our 20th season on the air. And so I'm hoping we can make it a big one. Uh, we are reaching out to see if people want to advertise and sponsor with the show. 
Uh, we're trying to do some other things, uh, get partners back on after a year with a pandemic that kind of hurt everybody. Um, so I'm looking forward to it. I can't believe it's a month away. I am not ready as this place clearly shows, um, but I'm looking forward to it and uh, appreciate you. Let me plug it. Yeah. I, I appreciate your time guys. This is a lot of fun to get together. I think we're all looking forward to the same thing. It's October 12th. The day we're recording this, we're three days away from the start of practice and then things start moving awfully fast. Uh, um, sorry, go ahead, Ryan. All I'll you just say if the uh, voting panel uh, is requesting information from your team, coaches, Please. if you're still watching, the SIDs got emails today. So yeah. uh, get on that, respond, answer the questions, Please. and we'll have as much information as possible. Hey, I know none of us here are going to do this, but it has been known for teams that do not respond to the questionnaire and don't have information in there, they get less votes in the early poll. It just happens that way. When you don't see the information there, it's easy for voters to skip over teams that should be on there. So answer those, get them in. And I believe if everything's on schedule, we'll have a published poll before the end of October. It's a good point because there was a, I was having a conversation with Pat Coleman earlier about a couple of teams I thought he was missing. And I sent those his way. And one of them, he said, yeah, I, I reached out to them and they declined. They just said, nah, this isn't the, the right time. We're not there. And I was like, oh, I kind of probably would have voted for them. So I still may, I still may, but it makes it dip more difficult when you don't submit all your stuff that says, you know, you have four starters returning and 62% of your points. We have a lot of information when we vote. And uh, so that plea is if you're getting that request from d3hoops.com, please respond to that because it allows the 25 voters to do their thing. Bob, to your point, if we're reaching out to you, even if you think it's too early for you, and I get maybe it's a little thing, I don't want my voter, my players to see we're getting attention. If we're if we're reaching out, it's attention for you, even if you don't love it. Yeah. It's worth it's worth submitting so that people can then make an educated, a better educated guess at yeah. it. Well, than, than shooting darts. And the yeah. other way, we also reach out if you were getting votes at the end of last year. Right. You lost... If you lost 10 guys, you want the voters to know that. Right. Because you don't want to be getting preseason votes right. on a team that's going to go 10 and 15, right? right. Like that's, that's the other part of it. Yeah. Well, guys, thank you so much for the time. Again, Akiva Poppers, Ryan Whitnabel, Ryan Scott, and the OG himself, Dave McHugh. <laughs> guys, thank you so much. Uh, th that was the QCast Season 3 Episode for the Top 25 Men's Basketball Roundtable. Uh, this thing is getting cranked up pretty soon, and we'll be at it before you know it. Guys, thank you so much, and let's do this really soon. Thanks, guys. Thank you.